Welcome to the Newsmakers Podcast. I'm Billy Hollowell, and this is a show where we go behind the headlines every day to bring you an interview with a pastor, entertainer, politician, or other notable news figure. And this is a show, again, it's daily, but it's based on our weekly TV show, which is also called Newsmakers. You can watch it on the CBN News Channel and also on our YouTube page. And on this show, every day, we dive deep. It's a little more longer form with one of the people who you will often see on our Newsmakers show or across the CBN News platforms. On today's Newsmakers, we welcome the family member of a Hamas hostage survivor. Today, we're going to be talking with Moshe Lavi, whose brother-in-law, Omri Moran, was taken hostage on October 7th. Now, we're going to get into the details of that story, what unfolded, and how it is impacting Moshe's family. So much to unpack here. It's an incredibly heartbreaking story, but an important one for us to hear. With no further ado, here is Moshe Lavi. Tell me about Omri. Omri is a 46 years old man, is an incredible father to my two nieces, Ronnie and Alma, who are two and a half years old and nine, nine months old. Um, is an amazing husband to my sister Lishai, is a family man connected to us uh, since he came into our family, and of course to his, 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 his father and his siblings. His mother sadly passed away a few years ago is a spiritual man connected to, to nature, um, is a shadow therapist and a gardener. So he would heal plants during the day and his patients during the evenings in his clinic, um, loves literature, loves sports, is, is exactly the person you want to meet and, and, and laugh with, is, has a great sense of humor, and beautiful smile, has a gentle heart. Um, I think the world misses him. Uh, he added a lot to, the, to, to his community in Kibbutz Nachalos, added a lot to this world, and I hope he will be free again soon so he can continue and contribute to it. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing who he is. I think a lot of times in, in the mix of everything that's happened, there's so much political and social commentary. We don't hear the stories of who the hostages actually are. And so I appreciate you telling us that. Take us through... October 7th, from your perspective, what you experienced, what you saw, you obviously you were in the U.S. here, uh, but just take us through that day for you. Yeah, for me, it was a Friday night. I, I just uh, arrived at a nightclub uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I live in Manhattan. I, I went out with friends uh, to, to a music concert there. And... Um, then I started hearing, um, getting messages that there are rocket attacks on Israel. I grew up in Starot on the Israel Gaza border, so I experienced rocket attacks. I normalized them, sadly. And so I didn't really uh, mind that at all. You just check with, with your family, friends, everyone is fine. It was normal. It felt it's, normal. It felt normal because, to be honest, that was our reality for so many years. And it pains me to say it because I think the fact we tolerated it and allowed our government to tolerate it, October 7th um, happened. That was one of the reasons. So, but I, after a few minutes, it was clear this is different because the reports emerged that Hamas terrorists and their thousands are um, invading Israel, invading communities. Kibbutzim like Nachaloz, where my sister Lisha and Omri live, towns like Sderot, my hometown, where my parents live. And um, I started getting messages from friends, from family, checking on them. I, of course, left the, the club. Um, uh, it was a weird experience because I just started to have a great time with music. And then you receive this news and you don't know how to, to cope with it. What, what was going through your heart in those moments of, you know, oh, my goodness, my parents, my sister, my brother-in-law, the kids? Um, it was, um, it's hard to describe. I think was the worst night in my in my life, and look, I, I served for six years in the military. I was a captain, so I've had a good share of of, of bad nights. Uh, but and of course, growing up to terrorism. But but that experience was was dreadful because you feel helpless. You're so far away. The only way you can communicate is online on WhatsApp, um, and you read the news. You see on social media horrific videos of of terrorists coming into my hometown, killing people, butchering people. Um, it was terrible. My heart was beating. I was losing sense of time and space, but I, I, 
after a few minutes, I said, I have to get a grip on myself. I, I took um, I took uh, an Uber and, and left back to my, my flat and was with my family all night. And around 4.30 a.m. Eastern time, U.S., we lost contact with my sister, Lushai, and Enomri. The last thing they did was sending a photo of my two nieces uh, playing with the family dog, Mojo. And they said that they're losing their battery um, on the phone and that electricity is gone, so they can't charge it. That was the last time we heard from them. And only 10 hours later, we found out what happened. Uh, my mom received a message that Lishai, my sister, survived, that the two uh, babies survived, but that Omri was taken hostage. Um, I'm grateful my parents uh, were rescued and survived, and my, my, both my sisters survived, but Omri was taken. And, and during that, those 10 hours, we learned that Hamas terrorists barged into their home. They used a teenage boy from the kibbutz, their neighbor, Tomer, a 15-year-old teenager, to lure them to open the door. So they, of course, opened the door to save his life. Later on that day, Hamas murdered Tomer um, and most of his family. Uh, for hours, they were abused at, his, at their home, um, held at gunpoint. Their house was ransacked, ravaged. They were later grouped with another family, the Dan family, whose daughter, Mayan, was murdered, 18 years old, in front of her uh, siblings, in front of her parents. Held hostage there for hours. Um, it was live stream on Facebook, all this ordeal. They took a, a phone from... Uh, the terrorists live streamed this. Yeah. They took the phone of one of the family members of the Dan family and live streamed this entire ordeal. We found out later. We have the footage. Have you uh, seen that footage? I, I've seen it. Um, it's... Uh, it's. I, I, I don't think anybody can imagine what we feel when we see it. You, you see my sister holding Alma, my, my young, youngest niece, as gun, gunshots are heard in the background, as rockets are heard uh, in the background, people screaming. They're sitting on the floor, held hostage at gunpoint. It, it's terrible. At some point, Omri was told to get up alongside uh, three others, um, and he was handcuffed and taken to Gaza as a hostage. My sister told him she loves him, she'll take care of the girls, and ask him not to be a hero because they're waiting for him to return safely home. And that was the last time she saw him. She was instructed to stay put or else she'll be killed uh, for hours more. And um, for hours more, she witnessed what's going on in the kibbutz uh, as it was burning, as people were screaming and shouting um, for their lives. But luckily, she was rescued by the IDF at 5.30 p.m. that day, 11 hours after the invasion started. We're grateful for that so much. She was rescued with a few others in the kibbutz. But uh, Omriz is a hostage, and so we haven't started the healing process, of course. And we're focusing, laser-focused, on, on bringing Omri home. Do you have any idea his whereabouts, his condition? Has there been any contact or information on him since October 7th? Hamas, uh, sadly, does not allow um, the, the hostages to be visited by the ICSC or any other international organization. They don't provide any proof of life. We have no credible uh, sources to uh, ensure that they provide him uh, efficient medical care either. We do know Omri was alive about 10 weeks ago because in the previous round of uh, release of hostages as a result of the negotiated agreement, um, some of the hostages were released in November, reported that Omri was alive, that he was in an okay condition, uh, and that, is, is, um, that he learned in captivity that Lishai, my sister, and his two daughters survived. That gave them strength, that he projected strength to others who were held captive with him. But it's been so long since then, and we don't have any proof of life. We don't know his condition. We don't know his whereabouts. And, and we hear the testimonies from hostages who were there about the torture, the abuse, Sexual violence, deprivation of food, water, proper sanitary condition. We are, we are terrified for what he's experiencing, but at the same time, we try and project hope because that hope helps us to advocate for him in, with public officials, elected officials here in the US, in Europe, all around the world, and of course, with our own government, Israel and the Israeli government, and with the public, as we do here in this conference. And, and you're here, you're speaking. I mean, this is not an easy thing to speak about 
what do you want the world to know? There are a lot of different opinions right now about what Israel should do, shouldn't do. I mean, lots of political opinions. What do you want the world to know? I want the world to know and unite behind the notion that the hostage crisis needs to be above the political discourse, that it is a humanitarian crisis. It is a multi-faith crisis. People of different faiths were kidnapped and murdered that day. It's a multinational crisis. People of different nationalities were kidnapped and murdered that day. That's what I want the world to focus on. There are political issues that need to be solved. There is, of course, the war um, that is being fought. But the issue of the hostages need to be separated from that. We need to ensure that the international community does it. And sadly, they don't. And and I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply disappointed and hurt to see that not all nations united behind our call, that not even every elected official in this country, the U.S., has been uniting behind the call to bring the hostages home. This should have been the call from October 8th from everyone who is, has a position of power, for every community leader who has a position of power. It hasn't been the case, but we keep on speaking up to remind these elected officials, to remind community leaders, leaders worldwide, international organization, etc., that these hostages are human beings, that they deserve to return to their home and their families, and that they're held by a terrorist organization who seeks only um, death um, and destruction in our region. Um, that's what I focus. I'm laser focused on that. I try and separate it from the toxic political discourse. And that's and that is a great way to message and get around that. And you know, a lot of people want to be praying for your family. I know that. So, how is your sister doing? Just as a final question, how are the kids doing without their father? It's been a difficult time um, for the family. Now, entire immediate family is displaced. Over 100,000 Israelis are displaced around Israel, living in temporary housing because of the conflict in southern Israel and because of Hezbollah attacks in northern Israel. Um, so we're dealing with displacement, loss of income, loss of jobs as a result, um, dealing with the trauma um, of, of October 7th, of, of the violence. Um, and of course, my nieces are dealing with the fact they don't have a father at, at home. My, my niece, Roni, who is two and a half years old, already speaks. She speaks of the violence she witnessed on October 7th. She shares it with the um, kids in the temporary kindergarten she goes to. How, how horrible it is that children at the age of, of two and three hearing this, she draws it in, in paintings in, in, in that she, she draws. Um, we, we take her to therapy because we have to do that to ensure that she gets every support she has. Every night my sister takes her out to, um, to say goodnight to the world, to the moon, to the stars, to nature. Omri used to do that, as I said, he was very spiritual and connected to, to the world. Um, and they say goodnight to, to Daddy Omri as well. They scream it, they cry for him. Um, but it's difficult. My, my sister is, is staying strong, taking care of the girls and doing a lot of advocacy work. Only this week she was in, in Brussels um, advocating with European Union officials. Um, she's been doing a lot in Israel as well. We all have been doing that together. Omri's father, Danny, his, his family. Um, I'm, I've been doing it in Israel here and here in the U.S. We have to stay strong for her, for Danny Omri's father, for the girls, um, and, and project the hope that we can bring him home until we know for certain that he will not return to us. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and spending some time just bringing us through this. We will be praying for you and your family. Thank you so much. That's all for today's Newsmakers podcast. Be sure to tune in for the next episode of the show and also head over to the CBN News YouTube channel and the CBN News channel to watch Newsmakers every week. We'll see you soon.